Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian. Today I'm here at the James Julia Auction House up in Maine. I'm taking a look at some of the cool firearms they're going to be selling in their upcoming October of 2016 firearms auction. And we're using a rifle today to answer a question that a lot of U.S. rifle enthusiasts may have, and that is, what is a gas trap Garand? Well, this is a gas trap Garand. This is one of very few existing, surviving, original, and unmolested gas trap M1 rifles. So the story starts with, well, John Garand's original design. Uh, he had avoided drilling a hole in the barrel. He didn't have a gas port. This was not that uncommon of a practice in the 1920s and 1930s. There were some theories that drilling a gas port, and remember, this is early in the history of gas-operated semi-automatic rifles. People suspected that a gas port would lead to erosion of the rifling, it would cause accuracy problems, and that the gas port would expand over time, and so your rifle wouldn't have a very long service life. Now, it turns out most of these problems have turned out to really be non-issues, but they didn't necessarily know that in the early 1930s, when, for example, Garand was designing this rifle. So instead, what they did was design it in a gas trap manner, Garand did. Um, the Germans also had some rifles like this, and, and a number of other countries experimented with it. The idea being, instead of actually drilling a hole in the barrel, what they would do is have a gap between the end of the barrel and the actual end of the muzzle, and kind of tap gas off from behind the bullet and run it into a gas piston. We'll take a, an up-close look at how this mechanism works in just a minute. But this is how the original M1 Garand was built when it was adopted. Uh, the M1 was adopted in, uh, well, it was first assigned a designation in 1934. It was formally adopted uh, in its final form, well, this form, in 1936. And then it took a couple of years before production really got going. Uh, the, the government and Springfield Armory knew that they wanted to have a, they wanted to equip the whole army with these. That's going to take a lot of rifles. And so you're going to have to tool up and build all the fixtures and the jigs and get the machines in place to be able to manufacture these in large numbers and quickly. And that, like I said, took a couple of years. So it wasn't until actually October of 1939 that this system was finally discarded. And at that point, they'd only built about 18,000 rifles. Now, there are a couple of, well, we'll go into the reasons why they changed that when we look at it up close. But during some testing, they decided, you know, this isn't optimal. We'd, we'd kind of like to change it. Um, so October of 1939, they adopt the gas port system, which we'll also look at in a moment, uh, comparatively. And at that point, the way rifle production was working, they were making, the idea is you'd make all the parts independently, and then you'd have an assembly line where you'd actually assemble complete rifles. So the parts manufacturer was way ahead of the actual rifle manufacturer. And in October, when they decided to change the system, well, they already had a lot of barrels and gas systems manufactured. And the decision was made that we'll, we'll stop manufacturing these obsolete types of the part, we'll start making the new version, the gas port version, uh, but we'll go ahead and use these. It'd be silly to throw away tens of thousands of, of parts that will make functional rifles, even if they're not the best version of the rifle. So they actually kept manufacturing gas port, gas trap guns until August of 1940. And in total, a little over 51,000 of these were originally made. Now this particular one is serial number 30,562, and it was manufactured in March of 1940. So it's, it's one of the later ones. This was actually made after the decision had been made to get rid of this system, but they still had the parts, so they made it. So if 51,000 of these were made, why are they so rare today? Well, there are a couple different reasons. Primarily, this was officially an obsolete design. So 51,000 of these were made, and then almost immediately afterwards, the US went headlong into World War II, where all of those rifles were going to be pretty heavily used, because those are the very first of the M1s available to be issued out to combat troops. So a lot of the rifles were destroyed in combat. A lot of them were damaged. And if a damaged gas trap rifle came back to, the, to an armory or a, a repair depot, it would be rebuilt in a gas piston or gas port configuration to get rid of the obsolete version. So through the course of World War II, a great many, the majority of these guns were refurbished out of their original configuration. So you can still find M1s with serial numbers under 51,000, but virtually all of them are going to be in the, the modern configuration. Now the follow-up reason is by 1947, there wasn't, you know, the war pressure was off, 
Uh, and this was now, there was no, no longer a good reason to keep these guns in service with non-standard parts and so, uh, non-standard cleaning, cleaning uh, manual of arms. If you give this to a new recruit in 1947, you have to teach him a different way to clean the rifle than the guys who have all the other rifles in his unit. So in 1947, the Army actually ordered all of the existing remaining gas trap guns to be destroyed. Now, I don't know how many still existed at that point, but the vast majority of them that were around then were destroyed uh, because of that army order. So surviving examples are going to be quite scarce. They're ones that managed to filter out of the system somehow between 1940 and 1947. All right, so let's take a close look at the business end of this thing. This is the gas trap assembly. It's distinctive, well, in, in a couple of ways. The, the assembly here is a different shape, but maybe more obviously it has these flat wings on the front sight makes it stand out a bit. Now, to disassemble this, we first have to take out the operating rod, which I've already done. I've already done all of the back end disassembly on this, just so that we aren't going to spend the time on this video, because that stuff all comes apart just like a normal M1. Now, the next thing you have to do in order to remove this gas system is actually to remove the front sight. So I'm going to take this screw out. It's interesting because the front sight actually acts as the spline that locks the gas system, the gas piston or the gas cylinder onto the barrel and in alignment. Now that that's out, we can unthread this whole assembly from the barrel. And you can see the slot right there where the front sight sits in place. That's what prevents the gas cylinder from unthreading during normal use. Now to further disassemble this, we're going to take out this screw, which allows us to remove the gas plug. There we go, pull that out, and now we can slide this gas plug out of the gas cylinder. All right, so what's going on here is you have the muzzle, which slides into this top section, and it comes to a rest right there. You can see that it's a, a capped front assembly, and we have a small diameter hole in the front. And then this open hole in the bottom is where the gas piston sits. So I have our gas piston here. That is going to slide into the assembly right there and comes up to that point. Now, normally it would come to rest right about there. So that's where the gas piston is operating. Then this plug redirects gas. When I set this in here, you can see this open space between this front sight block and the gas plug, that is effectively your gas port. So the bullet's going to go through this hole, and it's going to go continue through that hole, which is a little bit larger than 30 caliber, so it doesn't obstruct the bullet. The gas is, for this very short time, going to be diverted downward to this area, and that is right in front of the gas piston. So instead of actually drilling a hole in the barrel, you're basically just capturing the gas off the front end of the muzzle. Once the gas comes down here, it's going to push the gas piston backwards and that's going to cycle the gun. Now there are a couple of different explanations for why this system uh, was replaced in service and you know, you'll hear ones like, well, it wasn't accurate because the whole front sight assembly is on this removable part that can get loose uh, or Similarly, that the bayonet lug wasn't strong and sufficient because you've got this bayonet lug on this whole piece that's threaded and only held in place by this one little spline. In, in reality, it appears that the rationale was actually that during some of the early testing, during one particular testing session, this screw, this one, came loose and actually fell out of a test rifle. After that happened, front sight stayed in there, but it'll fall out while I'm demonstrating. Once the front sight fell out, this gun was hot and it was being fired a lot, and the gas plug slid just slightly up. Probably something like that. Just a little bit out of alignment. Now, the hole in the bore here does not line up with the hole in the barrel. There we go, now you can really see the effect. And after that screw fell out and the gas plug slid slightly upward, the next round hit the gas plug and blew the entire gas cylinder assembly off of the rifle. And that was kind of the, uh, the wake up that, ooh, this, this could be a very significant problem. That was, 
and that was the primary impetus for the change to a gas piston system. Now I also have a gas piston M1 here, so let's take a look at how these compare. Alright, now here we have a totally normal uh, wartime M1. This is the standard, what they called a splined barrel, or a splined gas system replacement. So, so instead of being held on by the front sight, these guys are held on by a gas plug. And now normally you would use the cleaning tool to do this, but a big screwdriver will work. You can loosen this gas plug. Once that comes out, we now have this, which is just a lock to hold the gas cylinder in place. It is still threaded on the barrel, so you can see the similarity to the original gas trap guns, where they, we still have threading on the barrel here, but now it's not holding on the whole cylinder, it's just holding on this locking piece. And once that lock is off, then the whole gas cylinder comes off the front of the barrel. These, instead of being held in place by one spline, which is the front sight, are held in place by three, uh, equally spaced around uh, the, the collar there. There are three matching cutouts in the barrel, where those slide into place. And this, this is a much more secure um, attachment system for holding on the gas cylinder and the front sight. And of course, normally you wouldn't remove this piece just for normal cleaning. Because you can take the gas plug out of the front, you can clean the barrel and the gas system both while this gas cylinder is still on the gun. So in addition to being held better in place, it's also not necessary to remove it nearly as often. So all in all, a much better system. Well, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's a very cool opportunity to get a look at a very scarce American uh, pre-World War II M1 rifle. So if you'd like to add this to your own collection, it would certainly be the highlight of nearly any M1 collection or American rifle collection. Take a look at the description text uh, below. You'll find a link there to the Julia Company's auction page or catalog page on this item. And uh, you can see their pictures and read their description and the provenance on the rifle. And uh, place a bid by phone. Come up here and participate in the auction live in October. Thanks for watching.